Cincinnati, 911. What is the address? There's a baby me? in the zoo that fell in the gorilla moat. Okay. There's what? a baby in the zoo at the gorilla moat. Okay. Hurry. One moment. Hurry. The gorillas are out. At 3.52 p.m. on May 28, 2016, a 911 call was made about a young boy falling into the gorilla exhibit at the Cincinnati Zoo. The boy was three-year-old Isaiah Dickerson. His mother, Michelle Gregg, became distracted by his three other siblings, and he managed to slip away from her, sneak through the three-foot-high cable fence, push through four foot of bushes, and then fall 15 feet into the moat surrounding the gorilla exhibit. When Michelle realized that it was her son who fell in, she too climbed over the fence and stood at the edge that he fell off of. She called out to him, instructing him to be calm. Other members of the public also climbed over the fence to keep an eye on Isaiah, one of them recording what was happening. All of the people at that enclosure quickly became aware of what happened, but the three gorillas inside the enclosure were completely oblivious to what happened. At first. The gorillas inside that enclosure were two 20-year-old sisters, Chewie and Mara, and there was also a 17-year-old 450-pound silverback called Harambe. After two minutes of Isaiah splashing around in the moat and the public causing a commotion, the gorillas finally became aware that Isaiah was in there with them at 3.54 p.m. Also taking notice of the commotion were the zookeepers, so they signaled to the gorillas to enter their holding pens, which is something that they did on a daily basis. Chewie and Mara obeyed the command, but Harambe didn't. He climbed down the ladder into the moat to get a closer look at Isaiah. Harambe first stood over Isaiah in a corner of the moat. <laughs> Okay. Then he suddenly dragged Isaiah through the water. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god. But things did seem to calm down a little bit when Harambe stood him up and seemed to analyze his clothing a little bit. That was short-lived because Harambe dragged Isaiah to a part of the moat that was out of view from the public. After that, he carried Isaiah up the ladder and onto the land area of the enclosure. At 4 p.m., with Isaiah sitting in between Harambe's legs, the zoo's dangerous animal response team aimed a sniper rifle at Harambe. Seconds later, Harambe was shot in the head, killing him instantly. The backlash after the killing of an endangered silverback gorilla named Harambe at the Cincinnati Zoo. There were a bunch of reactions to what happened, but the most common one was of outrage. Animal lovers from around the world saw what happened to Harambe as very preventable, and the person many people thought could have prevented it was Isaiah's mother, Michelle. It also didn't help that a witness claimed that they tried to stop Isaiah from falling in before his own mother had seen him. It's the fact that it probably could have been prevented. I couldn't get to him quick enough. I know I'm not the parent, but I did see it and I tried and he was on a mission. And according to another witness, Isaiah was talking about wanting to go in with the gorillas. I heard the exchange while I'm waiting. The little boy, I'm going to go in. No, you're not. I'm going to go in. No, you're not. The mother turns around to her other children. Because of that, a lot of people believed that Isaiah should have been removed from that area before he got the chance to get in. But even before the witnesses started to speak out about what happened, there were tons of claims that Michelle was a neglectful and irresponsible parent. So a lot of the outrage was directed at her. You know, I'm disgusted at the mother. Why wasn't she watching her child? It takes longer than a few seconds to climb in or climb under a barrier. The mother should have been watching her child more closely. I think the parents are negligent, so. If anything, I think it would be there. A petition was even made to have her prosecuted. It was to encourage the Cincinnati Zoo, Child Protection Services, and the Cincinnati Police to hold the mother responsible. And that got over 500,000 signatures. The day after the incident, Michelle made a Facebook post about what happened. She said that Isaiah got a few scrapes and a concussion, and also said that accidents happened. She had also been receiving a tsunami of hate online. The place where she worked was even getting hate messages. We were able to get some kind of insight as to what kind of messages she was receiving, 
Not because she told us, but because a different Michelle Gregg became the target inadvertently. The wrong Michelle Gregg was screenshotting the abusive messages she was getting and then posting them onto social media. A lot of the messages were very rude. Um, they were saying that I should have been the one to die and the gorilla should have lived. She was being called a bad mum, and she was just in general being insulted. So while that was all going on, the Cincinnati police were investigating what happened that day. They interviewed four witnesses and jobs and family services were sent to visit Michelle's house. The investigation concluded on the 2nd of June, and then the prosecutor announced the outcome of their review on the 7th of June. And the outcome was that no charges would be filed against the mother. We have concluded that no charges will be filed against the mother of the three-year-old who fell on May 28th into the gorilla encampment. Had she been in the bathroom smoking crack and let her kids run around the zoo, that'd be a different story. But that's not what was happening here. She was being attentive to her children by all witness accounts, and the three-year-old just scampered off. And Michelle wasn't the only one to receive backlash. The zoo also came under fire for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason was that Harambe was killed. When he was shot, one of the first questions that came up was, why couldn't he have been tranquilized? So gorilla and animal experts from around the world weighed in on if that was a viable option or not. Some believed it was a possibility because while Harambe may have seemed aggressive, his behavior wasn't technically aggressive in gorilla terms. The gorilla's behavior was textbook protective behavior for a gorilla. They run around with their kids like that in the wild. The kids know to jump on the back. Any gorilla expert should know that gorilla was not acting violently towards that child. It just was being a gorilla. And unfortunately, it paid the ultimate price for something that was not its fault. What do you make of that situation? You know, truthfully, it looked to me like he was kind of going into gorilla protective mode, or at least gorilla very puzzled mode. Isaiah's grandmother even said that the zoo could have taken a different route, and previous instances where children had fallen into gorilla enclosures were also brought up. Despite gorillas being depicted as violent beasts in movies, whenever they have come face to face with a child in their enclosure, they have always been nurturing and caring. In those cases, the children were able to be retrieved without killing the gorillas, so a lot of people believed that Harambe was just a misunderstood gentle giant. But there was also a whole other group of professionals that saw Harambe as everything but gentle. Did you see how he jerked him? When the minute I saw that video, when he got jerked like that, I said, oh God, I don't want to see the rest of this. I know what would happen. It's very sad, but you know, he could have killed the child easy. Yeah, that's Not true. meaning to. Yeah. 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 Was he trying to protect the child? In your eyes, as someone who does study gorilla? In, in my eyes, he was uh, acting erratically erratically he was uh, disoriented and uh, that also led the decision of course uh, not to dart the animal if you were to say dart your household pet if you were to receive a dart yourself there'd be a pretty dramatic response and if you were an animal like a gorilla and didn't understand it you could have some sort of displaced aggression that would go right at what's the new thing in your area. So while he may have actually just been a gentle giant, he physically wasn't being all that gentle, which could have resulted in the boy accidentally getting injured. And at the end of the day, the zoo would always put a human life over an animal life. That wasn't the only point of contention with the zoo. That was the first security breach at the Gorilla World exhibit since it opened in 1978. So a lot of people were wondering how the child was able to get into the enclosure to begin with. I'm not sure why the enclosure involved something that a child could climb over with not another thing the child could not climb over, but yeah. Everyone's blaming the mom? Are you kidding me? No. You should not be able to right get thing. into a gorilla I if agree. it's a zoo. So the organization Stop Animal Exploitation now filed a negligence complaint against the zoo. They brought up how this wasn't the first time that an animal enclosure hadn't been secure enough. In March 2016, a polar bear escaped into an area where only zookeepers were meant to go. So because of that and what happened to Harambe, they were seeking the maximum penalty of a 10,000 US dollar fine. It is clear that the Cincinnati Zoo, by not having sufficient enclosures, which allowed this child to enter the gorilla enclosure has violated the Animal Welfare Act. 
Ultimately, the zoo wasn't fined, but they were issued a critical citation. After an inspection from the US Department of Agriculture, it was determined that the barrier was not in compliance with the standards needed for housing primates. But the thing about that is that the fence wasn't new. It was there 30 years prior to Harambe getting killed. And during those 30 years, the zoo had undergone many inspections from the USDA and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, also known as AZA. And during those inspections, the fence was never once sighted. And there's actually a reason for that. Pretty much the federal standards around barriers on primate exhibits are very, very simple. They just have to keep the animals and the humans apart for the animal safety as well as the human's safety. There's no specific height that the barrier needs to be, there's no specific materials, and there's no other guidelines. It just has to keep them apart and everybody safe. And that's what the fence had been doing for decades. So the reason why the USDA determined the fence wasn't in compliance was because it failed. It was no longer adequate because it didn't keep them apart. So essentially zoos don't know if their fences are compliant until an incident happens. And then after that came out, the family of Isaiah released a statement. They said the findings didn't change anything for them and that they thank the zoo staff for their quick actions and they mourn the loss of Harambe with them. After the incident, the gorilla exhibit was closed for 10 days. And during that time, the zoo installed a new barrier. It is 42 inches high with wooden beams on the top and the bottom, as well as knotted rope netting. And while that was being constructed, a group of animal rights activists gathered outside of the zoo to hold a vigil for Harambe. The man who helped raise Harambe at the Gladys Porter Zoo in Texas also spoke about what happened. I worked with this gorilla family. I didn't think it was going to be this rough so early. I raised Harambe from the day he was born. And I raised two sons and he was no different than they were. So this incident left members of the public traumatized a mother at the receiving end of masses of online hate, and zookeepers had to see an animal that they loved be killed. So I just went over how all of that happened, but I think a much more important story is how Harambe came to be at the Cincinnati Zoo to begin with. But what is the market for gorillas and chimpanzees and other apes? Uh, the market is limited, but there is quite a large demand among the zoos. The craze for zoos to have gorillas began in the late 1800s in Europe. The interest eventually spread to the United States and then to Australia. And the man who was able to supply the demand for gorillas was known as Gorilla Hunter Dates Pickett. He was a Kansas City veterinarian who would catch gorillas in the African jungle and then sell them to zoos internationally in the mid-1900s. Nowadays, threats to gorillas in the wild are habitat loss, poaching, and disease, but one of the biggest threats to them decades ago was hunting them for zoos. Often entire families of gorillas would be killed so that the hunters could separate the babies from the mothers and then take the babies to sell. When they were securely tied, we felt sorry for them. They looked so pitiful. They did not realize it then, but they were just beginning a trip which took them halfway around the world. And I sincerely believe that they will live as long and as happily as they would in their native jungles. That was far from the case. In a 1963 interview with Dietz Pickett, he explained the process when transporting a gorilla overseas. He was pretty much the only professional who captured gorillas during that time. He was responsible for the majority of gorillas that ended up in zoos. And since he was pretty much the only one doing it, he had to learn everything on his own. One thing he learned was that gorillas gorillas were very susceptible to human diseases. 90% of the gorillas that he would capture would not survive. They had uh, trouble about five years ago, or up until about five years ago, with gorillas dying, losing about 97% of them before they ever got out of Africa. Why? Because they are so extremely susceptible to human ailments. Well, now, what have you done to, to make them survive? Well, I found out how to get them out alive. Uh, we found uh, that there were two problems. One was infection, which could be divided, divided up into a number, a number of different difficulties, and the other was uh, mental, emotional. Those animals seem to be very placid when you look at them, but actually they're just a seething mass of emotion. 
and the emotions alone can actually kill them. Some of the emotional issues were later elaborated on in the documentary Urban Gorillas. A lady who would rescue baby gorillas from poachers saw just how emotionally affected these babies were. They are very traumatized by the capture of their mother. They are very traumatized by the capture of their mother. I had a lot of problem with him. During the first few days, he kept me from sleeping. I think because he stayed on the body of his dead mother. As soon as I'd fall asleep at night and I wasn't moving anymore, I was like his mother. He'd start shaking me, trying to wake me, so I had to get up and walk around with him. Then he'd fall asleep again. I'd go back to bed and fall asleep, and half an hour later, he'd wake me again. I think that's what it is. I've had several babies like this. I think they're the babies who were desperate to wake their mothers, but their mothers never woke up. The New York Times also wrote a couple of articles about Deet's adventures. In the first article, he talks about how he captured eight gorillas ranging from five months to one year old. He said that at one point, all eight of them got heat stroke and one of them died from it. And then when he was transporting them overseas, he had a stopover in Paris, and because it was so cold there, two of them got pneumonia and died. When they finally arrived in New York, all of them were unconscious, with the youngest, who was named Hebu, nearly dead. Fortunately for Dietz, he only needed four gorillas, so it wasn't all that important if Hebu died or not. He had an order from the Honolulu Zoo for two gorillas, and then he also had an order from the Memphis and the Atlanta Zoo for one gorilla each. Unfortunately, after hanging on for so long, Hibu died the next day. But for some of the surviving gorillas, they went on to live long lives. One of them was the gorilla that the Memphis Zoo ordered. He was named Timmy, and he now has a little bit of a story behind him. He spent 30 years in isolation, but zookeepers eventually started introducing potential mates to him, but he didn't get along with any of them. That was until he was introduced to a gorilla called Katie, who he bonded with, but unfortunately, she turned out to be infertile. So the zoo decided to separate them and then ship Timmy off. The public thought it was such a sweet story that a lawsuit was filed against the zoo to try and keep them together, but Timmy was eventually separated and sent elsewhere. Another survivor from that journey was the gorilla that the Atlanta Zoo ordered. He was named Willie B, and he too has a little bit of a story. Much like Timmy, he spent 27 years in isolation. He had nothing more than a TV and a tire swing in his enclosure. Willie B was eventually given freedom and moved into an outside enclosure where he was also given the opportunity to raise a family. And before this Willie B, there was also another Willie B who was also captured by Dietz. But the first Willie B got pneumonia and died two years after they got him, so that's why they got a replacement Willie B. It's unknown what happened to the other two gorillas that Dietz brought back to the United States that time. It doesn't appear that the Honolulu Zoo got their order of two gorillas. According to stud book and pedigree logs, that zoo has only ever had two gorillas, but those two gorillas don't line up with the dates that Dietz brought those gorillas into the United States. But it was actually very common for gorillas acquired by zoos around this time to only live for months months or even weeks. So maybe the Honolulu Zoo got them, but just weren't able to keep them alive for very long, or maybe they went to another zoo that I just can't track down. But since not much was known about gorilla care at the time, their dietary, social, and housing needs were rarely ever met. They were usually housed in small metal cages with virtually no natural elements, so only the hardiest of gorillas survived. Over the decades, their enclosures did start to improve, but it was a very slow process. This is a big day, isn't it, Dr. Purnell? What do you think of it? Boy, it is that. It really is, Bob. We're just as proud as we can be. Did you ever think you'd see the day when you could stand this close to gorillas without having about 19 layers of duck bumps of pure fear? Gorillas spend a lot of time in the wild laying amongst each other, grooming and slapping each other, and they seem to enjoy close social contact, body contact. Our gorillas literally never touch each other. They do not lay on top of each other, they do not lay next to each other, they do not groom each other. They're pretty much strangers in a 20 by 40 foot cement pad.
In the summer of 1989, demolition began. With the guerrillas safe in temporary quarters, their old exhibit finally crumbled, making way for a new naturalistic habitat, where the guerrillas will live amidst shady trees and rolling hills. Aside from their enclosure improvements, Gorillas in captivity still faced a host of other issues. Captive gorillas are known to eat their feces and regurgitated food. In the 1980s, 65% of zookeepers reported that their gorillas regurgitated and then re-ingested their food. It is completely unknown why they do this, but a study done in 1999 offered a potential explanation. They said it could be a response to elements of boredom, diet, stress, space restriction, or lack of control in the captive environment. A 2009 study talked about how it is a common abnormal behavior for captive western lowland gorillas. And to date, there has been no published reports of wild great apes engaging in that behavior. Research has also been done on how captive gorillas react to when there is lots of people visiting the zoo that they're at compared to when there is not many people at the zoo. A study done in 2005 found that on summer weekends when the zoo would get on average 1,300 visitors. The gorillas would be more likely to groom themselves, they would be more aggressive to each other, and they would be more likely to clench their teeth and repetitively rock back and forth. That's one of the things that really hits home. It's what an injustice we're doing to them. Hi, they sit in their concrete little cubby hole with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or maybe 100 or 200 people literally 20 or 30 feet away yelling for them to do something. There's nothing that they can do. We do put food out for them, but they really consume that food in a very short period of time. And once they've done that, they're really there's nothing left but for them to sit in a, in a very sterile, boring environment pressed right up against the public. But during winter weekdays when 10 or fewer people would visit the zoo, gorillas spent significantly more time resting. Another study done in 2011 at a separate zoo found that gorillas were more likely to charge at people, posture, and stare when the zoo was busier and noisier. Western lowland gorillas are actually the only kind of gorilla that will withstand this kind of treatment to an extent. Other gorillas, like the mountain gorilla, simply just can't survive in captivity. It's kind of unknown whether other species of gorillas could survive in captivity because during the time when it was allowed to capture gorillas in the wild, to take them to zoos, they were just too inaccessible to capture. And then in 1973, the Endangered Species Act banned the import of gorillas into the United States before they had the chance to try and capture them. So yeah, Western lowland gorillas are the only kind of gorillas in zoos, pretty much. While they may be able to survive into adulthood in zoos and sometimes even live longer than they would in the wild, heart disease kills 41% of captive gorillas in North America and 70% of captive male gorillas currently have heart disease. And no one has been able to determine why that's the case. It's been theorized that it's the result of the greater body fat found in captive gorillas who have a lot less space to exercise. Or it could have something to do with the fact that their diet lacks an African plant called grains of paradise, which makes up 80 to 90% of their diet in the wild. Harambe's father, Moja, suddenly collapsed in his enclosure, and it was determined that the cause of his death was heart disease. So yeah, it hasn't been uncommon that male gorillas are subjected to a lifetime of loneliness Loneliness, where the odds of getting heart disease are very much in their favor. Female gorillas don't have it easy either. They have been treated like breeding machines. And that is how Harambe came to exist. His grandmother was one of them. The grandparents were four and a half, five years old, five and a half years old. I unpacked them when they came from Africa. And uh, I've seen all the babies be born. Harambe's maternal grandparents, Katanga and Lamidoc, had 17 children together, one of them being Harambe's mother. Much like how the gorillas taken from the wild would struggle to survive in captivity, 
gorillas born in captivity also struggled to stay alive. Most of Katunga's babies didn't last long. One was stillborn and then another was aborted, but I couldn't find any information whether she was the one who aborted her own baby or whether a vet did it. The stud book just lists the baby as aborted. Two more died in the first four years of their life, one of colitis and then one of pneumonia. Another was killed by her father, Lammy Doc, when she was five years old. One died at 12 years old of hemolytic anemia. One made it to 40 years old and three of them are still alive. I'll talk about what became of Harambe's mother a little later on. Katanga had these 17 babies over the course of 27 years between 1972 and 1999. In the wild, gorillas typically only give birth every four to six years. So had she still been in the wild, she only would have had five or six babies. You may be thinking that Katunga was able to produce offspring so frequently because a number of her children died, which would mean she would become fertile sooner. But each year from 1978 to 1981, she gave birth every year. And each of those babies survived and lived past four years old. But even though her babies survived, she wasn't the one looking after them. Her babies were taken away from her immediately after birth. She didn't breastfeed them and she didn't look after them, meaning she immediately got fertile again after she gave birth to them. So yeah, her babies would be taken and hand raised. Nowadays, hand rearing is only done if it is absolutely necessary. But for many decades, most zoos had a policy to automatically take the babies away from high profile primates, especially the great apes. Usually it was done to ensure the survival of the baby, but it was found in a 2006 study that a decreased birth interval in gorillas was seen as an added benefit to hand rearing. And zoos often had designated areas where the public could observe the babies that they took away from the mothers. Jerry Stones, the man who helped raise all of Katunga's children and some of her grandchildren, including Harambe, housed all of the babies in what they called the children's zoo. And some of the other keepers here took them home at night too. We took turns because it gets to be a little tiring. And and we'd bring him back in the morning. He'd spend the days in our children's zoo in the nursery window, and, and then he'd go home again with us at night. This is our children's zoo, and among other things, we have our uh, baby primates housed in this area. Here you can see one of our young orangutans being uh, fed its noonday. <laughs> That's a cute little baby, isn't it? And while they wanted to get more and more babies for breeding purposes and to show off in their exhibit, it was absolutely necessary to take them away from their mothers. The mothers just did not know how to look after a baby. For gorillas, caring for a baby is learned. It is not instinctual. Why do you have the babies in the nursery? Why not leave them with the mothers? Well, we'd like to, but unfortunately, in many cases, uh, for the larger primates, the technique for taking care of a baby is not an instinctive one, it's learned. Mm -hmm. And most of the primates that are in captivity were caught by uh, having the adult shot and the baby stolen and taken and, and sold into captivity. So in that situation, the babies didn't ever get a chance to learn how to take care of them babies mm -hmm. as they grew up. So since Katunga was taken from the wild before she had the chance to learn how to be a mother, she wasn't able to be a mother herself. She could give birth, but she didn't know what to do after that. And because all of her children were hand raised by zookeepers, none of them knew how to be mothers either. And that is how Harambe came to be hand raised by Jerry Stones as well. His mother, Kayla, did not know how to look after him. There were some exceptions and some gorillas were able to work out how to look after their babies on their own, but for the vast, vast majority of them that were hand raised or taken from the wild, they just did not know how to look after their babies. Gorillas actually have a pretty complex language. They have 13 to 20 different vocalizations and inflections and many facial expressions and body postures. There are also dynamic rules of etiquette in gorilla societies and they must start learning these skills and life lessons from day one, just like humans. But because they were taken from the wild and hand reared, many gorillas missed out on 
on learning all of that sort of stuff. And that had effects on their personality development and their ability to mix with other gorillas later on in life. An example of that was when a young female gorilla was shipped to the LA Zoo to breed but she simply did not know how to act around a silverback gorilla because she had been hand reared. So that silverback did not react well to how she was acting around him. The newcomer's inexperience in the world of adult gorillas becomes immediately apparent. Rapunzel's unexpected aggression towards the dominant male sets off a chain of events that no one could predict. Miraculously, Rapunzel emerges unharmed. Fortunately, they've now worked out ways to be able to leave the baby with the mother and still keep it alive so it can learn all of the important things it needs to learn. No one knows this. That girl was raised here at the Columbus Zoo and was on a breeding loan up there. It was raised by people here at the Columbus Zoo. I don't mean the people, except with the people. I'm talking about from birth until we put it back with the adults. Why is that? Because the mothers here weren't feeding. A lot of girls throughout our country were having issues. Now today, we don't do that. We do it if a girl is injured at birth or something. We have to. But now we've learned ways that we, that we can keep those babies in there when we think she might not be nursing. We now have a much better situation with the gorillas. And if they absolutely need to hand rear a gorilla, the zookeeper will wear a furry vest and carry the baby how its mother would have been carrying it. So things have come a long way. But an issue that is still present to this day from treating gorillas like they're breeding machines is that there is a surplus of gorillas in captivity. And there actually has been for a while now. You may have heard of Ivan the gorilla. He's had books written about him, documentaries, countless news stories, and a Disney movie based on his life. He was a gorilla who lived as an attraction in a shopping mall. He was kept in a concrete cage without any other gorillas for 27 years. For 15 years of that time, the owners of him were actually trying to get him a better life. They were trying to get him adopted or to bring a female to come live with him. But since zoos already had too many male gorillas as it was, they couldn't take Ivan, and they couldn't spare any female gorillas to be with Ivan because they were already occupied with pairing their female gorillas up with their surplus males. Since 2011, a number of European zoos have started castrating their surplus male gorillas. Castration allows them to stay in their social group past the age where they would have been exiled by the silverback. But by castrating a male gorilla, it completely alters their physical and psychological logical makeup. The new silverback doesn't see the castrated males as rivals. The procedure was carried out before they'd reached puberty, which explains their abnormal development. Looks like Kermit. <laughs> Despite how shocking their deformed bodies look, it does seem like a fair solution. That is until you remember that it is an endangered species and the zoos that do this sort of thing are all about conservation on their website. Petitions were made to stop the castration of gorillas. And then in 2021, documents were leaked that zoos in Europe were no longer going to be doing castration. They were instead just going to cull them. In European zoos, it's common practice to cull their animals, and in some cases they even feed the animals to their other animals. But they hadn't yet pulled the trigger on culling gorillas because as we learnt with Harambe, 
don't fuck with gorillas. Of course, there was mass outrage to the culling news, so the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums released a statement. They basically said that the idea of culling was thrown out during one of their discussions, but they hope it won't be implemented. They said that before they go to that option, they will first see if selective abortions would be feasible, and then the remaining option would be to cull. But that is unlikely to change over the short to medium term. But with European zoo directors believing it is inevitable, it is only a matter of time before it actually becomes a reality. Maybe I'm just hoping that I'll be retired before it comes to that. But sadly, I know, I believe that it's the only option for sustainably managing endangered and small populations. It will allow us to ensure reproduction and other animal welfare priorities. That's why it's important for us to talk about it and for people to give some thought to the issue. If zoos didn't excessively breed gorillas as much as they did back in the day, then there wouldn't be nearly as many surplus gorillas as there are now. Zoos exist for a very important reason, to help ensure that endangered species don't become extinct. While gorillas were being castrated and there were talks of culling, a question that was thrown around a lot was why couldn't they be introduced to the wild? Because some zoos have played an important role in introducing some extinct species back into the wild. Sometimes zoos have gotten lucky and they have just so happened to have an animal at a zoo when they have gone extinct in the wild, like the Przewalski horse. They went extinct in the 60s and ever since the 90s, zoos have been reintroduced these horses back into the wild and they now have a wild population of around 300. And sometimes zoos have sought out a particular animal to ensure that they have a captive population at the time that they inevitably go extinct, like with the Hawaiian crow. None of the attempts to reintroduce the Hawaiian crow have been successful, but they are trying. So why can't similar attempts be done with gorillas? For one, it is a very difficult thing to do. For a lot of species, especially the bigger, more cognitively complex species, putting them back out into the wild is incredibly difficult. The key to knowing which ones can actually be released is a concept called cognitive complexity. A good way to think about it is to look at how long it takes for a particular species to learn skills in the wild. A man from the UK named Damien Aspinall has a sanctuary for gorillas that he eventually releases into the wild. But before they can be released, the gorillas all need to go through some kind of training school to learn how to survive in the wild. Damien has established a groundbreaking program which he calls Gorilla School. <laughs> the mission? To teach these captive gorillas, born and bred in the English countryside, to live wild and free in Africa. He's done some really good work for gorillas and he's been able to release a bunch of them into the wild. Even if zoos could handle the difficulty of releasing a gorilla into the wild, it's not as if they'd want to, to begin with. A zoo in Germany spoke about how they need animals to reproduce, otherwise it's just an illusion that they're saving the species. Taking it to the extreme, you could say, we're going to stop breeding them because the growing number of old animals pushes the population pyramid up. It becomes leaf-shaped and eventually you have zero at the stem, meaning no new offspring. So the species is effectively extinct long before the last animal has died. It's illusory to just say, we have so many animals here. If they're unable to reproduce, then the species is dead. And some zoos go to great lengths to maintain this illusion. Gorillas are shipped from one side of the country to the other for breeding purposes. Sometimes a gorilla pairing won't even be compatible, so they'll have to ship in a new gorilla. Zookeepers put in a lot of work and gorillas are put through a lot of stress to make breeding happen. But gorillas don't have any issues with breeding in the wild. That is not why they are endangered. It is because of a number of other reasons like poaching and habitat loss. But the breeding is just justified by the London Zoo Zoo director, David Field. He told The Guardian that breeding creates a safety net for gorillas, but even though he is helping to create a supposed safety net for gorillas in the event that they do go extinct in the wild, he still wants to help them survive in the wild. He also said that without the funding that comes from zoos, the programs for protecting gorillas in the wild would not get funding. According to Jack Hanna, a significant figure in 
the Uzu world. Zoos have sent tens of millions of dollars to protecting gorillas in the wild from poaching. And what, what we're trying to do, we sent millions of dollars over there. A lot of poaching gorillas have stopped now, thanks to the zoo world, giving over, who knows how many millions? Uh, our zoo, I wouldn't tell you how many, several million over the last few years. So the programs that protect gorillas in the wild do get heaps of money from zoos, but it is inaccurate to say that they wouldn't be able to support themselves without the funding from zoos. You may have heard of Diane Fossey. She was important in saving the mountain gorillas. She had a movie made about her. She wrote a book. She went on a bunch of talk shows to advocate for the gorillas and a whole bunch of other stuff. David Attenborough even credits her as saving the species. If anybody could say that they'd saved a species, I would think that Diane could. Uh, she undoubtedly uh, turned the world's attention towards gorillas. And she didn't save the species by showing them off in a zoo. The Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund was established and 42% of donations, which is the majority, come from individuals, not zoos. And one of the biggest contributors to the Diane Fund is actually Ellen DeGeneres. She actually funded an entire campus for them. And even for organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, their biggest contributors are from individuals. And it is highly unlikely that the those individuals decided to donate to these causes because of what they saw in zoos. In 2008, a group of researchers interviewed 206 zoo visitors on why they visited the zoo. 66% of them said to have an outing with friends or family, 12% said to learn about animals, and 11% said to be entertained. Those researchers also visited three zoos where they eavesdropped on people's conversations at 24 different animal enclosures. 6,000 comments were recorded and 70% of them were something descriptive in regards to the enclosure or the animal. Just over 20% of visitors sought out further information by reading signs. The lowest amount of comments were made in relation to people feeling sorry for the animals. In the very, very small sympathy category, the majority of sympathy comments, which was 12%, were made at the gorilla exhibit. The study concluded that in all the statements collected, no one volunteered information that would lead us to believe that they had an intention to advocate for protection of the animal or an intention to change their own behavior. So the organizations that help the gorillas in the wild can support themselves without the funding from the zoos. I'm sure it helps, but they do get the majority of their funding from individuals. And those individuals don't get inspired to donate to these causes that help gorillas from zoos, as those studies suggest. So if gorillas can be kept alive in the wild, with without the help of zoos, then what is the point of keeping them captive? Gorillas are still in zoos for the same reason they were when they were kept in small metal cages, to be an exotic attraction. He was not mean. He was a gentle little guy. He grew up to be a beautiful, beautiful animal, but he was never aggressive. He was never mean. Harambe may have been able to dodge the surplus gorilla list and heart disease, but ever since his birth, he was still an attraction, and even that came at a cost. Harambe was born on May 27th, 1999, at the Gladys Porter Zoo in Brownsville, Texas. His father was Moja, and his mother was Kayla, Katunga's 14th child. And Harambe was initially named Skeeter. His name changed when a contest was held to help name him instead. A man submitted the name Harambe, and he won. And I was listening to a particular reggae song, and the performer kept singing this word, um, Harambe, Harambe. And halfway through the song, she explained what it was, and it means to uh, pull together, to help each other, sharing and caring and come together. Wow, so th hence the name. Other than needing to be hand raised, Harambe's first two years of life were pretty much smooth sailing, but that changed on January 6, 2002. He and 10 other gorillas were put away in their holding pens for the night. But in that area, a zookeeper accidentally placed a plastic container of chlorine tablets near a standalone blower heater. These tablets were used for cleaning purposes, but they would not be able to clean up the mess that came next. Much like Harambe's grandparents had to witness 
the death of their families in the wild, Harambe had to witness the death of his in captivity. The blower heater caused the container to overheat and create a toxic chlorine gas. The heater blew the toxic fumes throughout the entirety of the holding area. It claimed the lives of his 10-year-old mother, Kayla, his 11-month-old full brother, Makoko, and his two-year-old half-sister, Yuzuri. His half-brother, Caesar, was found in serious condition, so he was sedated and placed on a ventilator. But despite their efforts to save him, he wasn't able to fully recover from the poisoning and died six months later. The next shakeup in his life would come in 2014 when he was transferred to the Cincinnati Zoo. This was done so he could join a new social group and learn adult gorilla behavior. That happened on September 18th, 2014. For seven months, he was held in the behind-the-scenes area of the zoo. During that time, his soon-to-be gorilla companions, Chewie and Mara, were being held in the adjacent holding pen where they could see each other. He was then officially introduced to them in the enclosure on April 28th, 2015. And then the day after his birthday in 2000. 2016, the incident with Isaiah falling into his enclosure took place. Nowadays, his legacy lives on through what happened to him that day, but also a bunch of other stuff. Elon Musk made a rap song about Harambe. Also, memes keep his memory alive. Thousands of people online have created some kind of meme involving Harambe. For the most part, they're just light-hearted fun, but they're a dark reminder of what happened that day. As long as the captivity of gorillas continues to be justified with our supposed need for education and entertainment, they will continue to be subjected to stressful conditions, a likelihood of getting heart disease due to an unsatisfactory diet, and fall victim to human error like accidental poisonings or falling into their exhibits. I think it's important to understand that some animals just aren't meant to live in captivity. If you want to see a gorilla, visit one in the wild. Gorilla tourism actually supports their survival in the wild. In order to see gorillas, you need to purchase a gorilla permit from the Uganda Wildlife Authority. So your money goes directly to the people who protect the gorillas. And if you can't see them in the wild, which is totally understandable, you can help support their survival in the wild. One way is by recycling your mobile phones because there are minerals in your mobile phones that are being mined in Africa that is destroying the gorillas' habitats. Another way is by donating. So yeah, thank you so much if you made it this far. I know this isn't my normal kind of content. And thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in my next video.